wasn't a change by attraction because you don't have to push, prod, persuade, or punish people to create change in your organization. I'm your host, Esther Derby. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the fingerprint principle. I had a conversation with a manager who was concerned about miscommunication and lack of communication in his organization. While in theory, all the teams were working towards the same goal in practice, it didn't look anything like that. And their efforts weren't really well-coordinated or even coherent. One team would tell the client to do X, and one other team would be training the same client and how to do Y. And none of them were really consistently working on the main goal of the organization, which was to reduce cycle time. So the manager was frustrated, and the teams were frustrated, and it showed up big time in their satisfaction surveys. Communication was the number one issue that came up. So the manager felt like he really had a mandate to do something about this. He recognized it was a problem. He had the data to back up that it was a problem, and he set to work. He designed a new process that was supposed to streamline communication, to help with goal setting, and to make sure the teams were aligned. He did the big reveal on a Monday. He got everybody into a room, and he got out his PowerPoint slides, and he gave a really great presentation. He showed all of the new information flows. He showed the goal-setting templates. He had diagrams about how things were going to flow and how things were going to work. And when he got done with his presentation, after showing all his slides, he turned to the group and said, you know, this really needs to be your process. You really need to own this. And I really want your feedback on this process I've designed. And there was dead silence. So what happened here? I'm pretty sure that the manager had good intentions. Actually, I believe that with no doubt. He was really trying to solve a problem for the group. So let's talk about what the manager did, and then we'll look at what he could have done differently. First, he started with the idea that because this had showed up in the satisfaction surveys, that he had a mandate to change it, and he knew exactly what needed to be changed. Second, he came out with a really polished presentation, and he had put a lot of thought into it because he really cared about it. He wanted to solve the problem. But the presentation was so polished, it looked so complete and so professional that it didn't really communicate that there was much room for people to get their fingerprints on it, for them to have any input. He also discounted his positional power. He was presenting something that looked really polished and finished that he had worked on by himself to the people who reported up to him. Now, there's always a certain amount of friction in giving feedback to your boss, even when they ask for it. There's always at least some perceived risk. Well, I shouldn't say always, but there's often a perceived risk that any sort of feedback that might be perceived by your manager is critical is going to show up in limiting your career in some way. It could be loss of promotion. It could be show up on your review. It could just be you lose favor and you don't get as good treatment as you had in the past. You lose some trust. So he did these three things that, to my mind, made it really predictable that when he asked for input, people were just going to sit there. So let's look at what he could have done differently. What could he have done to make it really easy for people to get their fingerprints on the change and feel like they owned it? Because when people have a part in defining, designing, refining, they're far more likely to feel ownership. So let's take a look. I actually think the first thing this manager could have done differently was how he handled the survey data. So he had all this information from the survey that people viewed communication as a big issue. That told him there was a problem, but it didn't give him enough nuance about what the problem was. So I had a manager once who, when she looked at her satisfaction survey, it was really clear that people felt she was unavailable. It came through loud and clear. So she gave out her home phone number, and she established office hours. However... The reason people felt she was unavailable was because whenever they were in a meeting with her, instead of making eye contact and clearly listening to them, she was checking her email, she was picking up her phone, she was responding to all sorts of notifications. So that's why people felt she was unavailable. And office hours 
wasn't going to help that, and nobody really wanted to call her at home. So survey data tells you there's a problem, but very often it doesn't tell you enough about the problem. So he could have started by getting input about how people felt about this with more nuance. He could have involved people in actually defining what the problem was. Because when people feel like they're solving a problem together, they have more investment in it. If you really want input, start at the start, not at the end. It's far more likely that people are going to feel free to give input when something is not defined, when it doesn't already look finished. Unconsciously, when people see a finished product, they believe that there's no room for their input. I mean, if you think about when you read a book that's already published, you don't think about giving feedback to the author. You may give a review, but you know that you're not going to have an impact on the contents of that book. But if you get a draft copy, you may feel a lot more free to have input, to feel like, yeah, if I point out these things, there's some chance they're going to change. So start at the start. Involve people before things are finished. Now, this doesn't mean you have to have everybody in every step of the way. He could have asked for input. He could have asked for a few volunteers to work with him, or he could have invited a few people to work with them. Any of those things didn't have to include everybody in the group, but it would have gotten some input. And he could have asked those people to gather input from others, to ask for review from other people. So there are a lot of ways he could have involved people from the start. So both of these things would have helped, but they wouldn't have addressed the positional power thing. So he could have delegated certain parts of the definition or certain parts of the design to members of the group rather than doing it himself. He could have just said, okay, you go off and you come up with three candidates and then we will go through a process to figure out which one is going to be the best solution for us in this time, or at least the best thing for us to start with as a solution, and then we can evolve it as we go along. So when you do this, it's important to be explicit about how input is going to be used. So are you saying you guys decide on what the process, after you develop three options, you decide which one you think is best, or we decide together, or I decide. And it's also useful to think about what are any options that are off the table? What are the things that are just out of bounds that you wouldn't accept? I talked to a manager who did delegate solving a problem to her team, and when they came back, they had chosen the one solution that she was absolutely going to reject. But she hadn't articulated that ahead of time. So it helps to think through what are the worst things that could happen and put some boundaries around what options are going to be acceptable so you don't end up in the situation of a game of bring me a rock. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever played that game, but it's really super frustrating and it tends to erode trust. And it goes like this. You tell someone to bring you a rock and they bring you a rock and you say, oh, no, not that rock. And they go off and get another rock, and that one comes back and said, well, I had a different kind of rock in mind. And that's a really perfect way to destroy trust between the person delegating and the person doing the work. So put some boundaries around it so you don't end up playing Bring Me a Rock. I think there are some other more subtle things that came through in this manager's request for feedback that probably helped it not go so well. One thing is that he presented this is this is the process I worked on, I developed. So he was using I language, which communicates ownership, and he used past tense, which indicates that it was already done. Shifting that pronoun and shifting the verb can help. So talk about we're working on and we are developing so that it's clear that the process is still ongoing. The other thing I noticed from this manager's story was that when he asked for feedback, he had just dumped this huge presentation on people, and then he asked them a very, very broad question. So they had just been exposed to the information. They probably hadn't had a lot of time to absorb it. They certainly couldn't go back and look at the beginning of the deck easily and check things or refresh their memory about things. And then they were asked this super broad question. So I often find that it's helpful to have a sort of funnel and start with maybe a still open but not quite as broad question, such as 
what's your first impression? Or when you look at the totality of this, what stands out for you? And then ask more specific questions. I mean, there's a reason when you lose your luggage when you're traveling by air and you go to the little luggage office, there's a reason they don't ask you to describe your bags. Because people often have a hard time starting from a blank slate. Like, I can recognize my luggage by the scuff from 30 feet away at the end of the baggage carousel and international arrivals. But if I had to describe those scuffs to somebody, I couldn't do it. So when you go to the luggage office, they give you this little card, laminated card, that has pictures of all sorts of suitcases, all the features on suitcases. So this kind of handle, five kinds of handles, different wheel configurations, zippers in different places. And when people look at those prompts, they can almost always describe their luggage with a fair amount of accuracy. Having more detailed questions serves the same function. When people get a super broad question, they often can't come up with an answer that is useful. But if you start with a broader question that gives some context and then ask more specific questions, people can often give you much, much better feedback. So he might have started with also giving people the material ahead of time and then giving them copies so they could actually absorb it. In what ways is this going to address our problem? What do you see is missing? What is extra? What might we add? What aspects have we forgotten? You can use those as sorts of prompts. And then depending on what it is, you can ask much more specific questions. And that will help people give much more specific responses that are going to be much more useful. So that's the fingerprint principle. If you want people to own something and feel like it's theirs, you have to let them get their fingerprints on it. Don't hit people with a finished product or a finished looking product. Make sure it still looks like a draft. Leave plenty of rough edges for people to smooth out. I sometimes even leave things out on purpose so there's stuff for people to fill in. If local variation is possible, make that clear. Make it clear what parts have to be closely managed and where people can modify and evolve the process and still maintain the intended outcome of the process or whatever it is you're working with. When you involve people in defining a problem, you'll probably get a deeper understanding. When you involve them in coming up with solutions or candidate solutions, you're going to get more ownership and probably a broader set of ideas. I'm always amazed at the things that people come up with and that groups come up with that may not have occurred to me. And it's because each of our brains work differently. It's not because anybody's brain is deficient that they can't come up with all the ideas. It's that we see things differently. We have different experiences. So broaden it out. When people are involved in defining processes or defining methods or defining how things should look in a change, they get a broader understanding of what their work is. So there's really a lot of upsides of involving people really from problem definition through shaping how something gets put into being, gets put to life. Now, I know that some people feel like this is going to take a really long time, that it's just faster to work on it yourself. Now, on some level, that might be true. It might take less time for you to start and finish a draft than it would to have a group of people working on it. But that's only because you're counting that portion of the change. You're not counting the portion of the change that's involved in persuading people to actually accept the change, to getting them to understand all the thinking behind it, and to have them actually do whatever the change is with some amount of enthusiasm instead of just mindlessly complying. So if I had to choose you know, I'm going to be spending the same amount of time. It's either you spend it at the front or you spend it at the end. And I'm pretty sure which one I'd choose. So what happened to the manager in the, at the beginning of this story? He interpreted his team's lack of input as not wanting to take initiative or take any responsibility. He felt really burdened by this, like he had to solve all the problems, even though he kind of set himself up for that. And he started resenting the people who reported to him. And he started being much more directive because he figured they weren't going to take responsibility anyway, so he had to tell them what to do. And then they started resenting him. And it ended up in a really 
damaged relationship where the trust that may have been there was completely gone. And it's really a shame because they both had ideas that were worthy. They both had good ideas, both the manager and the people on the team. And had they found a way to work together, I think they could have done some wonderful things. So that's the fingerprint principle. Create ways for people to shape the change throughout the process, from the definition through bringing it to life. I'd love to hear if these ideas resonated with you and how you might put them to work where you work. So feel free to drop me an email at esther at estherderby.com. Also, if you've got a topic you'd like me to cover, let me know. Thanks for listening. You'll find references and links mentioned in the episode at changebyattraction.simplecast.com. Check out my website and blog at www.estherderby.com. You'll find lots of articles about change, and you can sign up for my newsletter there. If you enjoyed the podcast, please let your friends know and rate it on Simplecast or wherever you get your podcasts. Mm-hmm.